محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله اشترى من المؤمنين أنفسهم وأموالهم بأن لهم الجنة يقاتلون في سبيل الله فيقتلون ويقتلون وعدا عليه حقا في التوراة والإنجيل والقرآن ومن أوفى بعهده من الله فاستبشروا ببيعكم الذي بايعتم به وذلك هو الفوز العظيم صدق الله العلي Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. On this very sad and sorrowful evening, we extend our sincere condolences to our master, the Imam of our time, Al Imam Al Mahdi Abdullah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. The one whose heart is aching now over the tragedy of Karbala, over the affliction that his grandfather, Abi Abdullah al Hussein, had to go through. On this night, we learn a very important lesson from the Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him. We all know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us to be tested. So many verses in the Holy Quran and narrations from the Ahlul Bayt demonstrate this point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us to be tested. For what purpose? The one who has created life and death to test you, to try you. Most people misunderstand what this test is really about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has infinite knowledge and He knows the outcome of our actions. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring us to this world, put us to the test, allow us to experience hardships and difficulties? Did He not know the outcome of our actions? Could He not straightly avoid this world 
and give us what we deserve? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring the human being to this life and put the human being on trial? And allow this human being to experience difficulties and hardships? Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enjoy simply testing us and putting us to difficulty? Allah is the most merciful, is the most compassionate, and He is the most wise. Every action that Allah does is based on His wisdom. It's based on His compassion. It emanates from His mercy. If we want to understand how is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us in this life, let's look at the common tests that we have in our lives, such as the examinations and the tests we go through in our schools. Why does, a why does a teacher or professor test his or her students? Does a professor enjoy testing the students? There is a purpose behind it. There is wisdom behind testing the students. When the students are being tested and there is an exam that they have to complete, this effectively trains the students. It makes them qualified. It prepares them for the real world. When a student is serious about his or her studies, and the goal is to pass that test, a student will sacrifice. A student will learn the subject matter. And therefore, such students achieve progress in society. The point of having a school system is so our children can achieve success. The point of colleges are to train you for the real world. The test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is similar in that it trains the human being. It allows the human being to achieve completion. Allah doesn't simply want to test us so He can give us what, he, what we deserve. That's not the point here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by creating us in this life and putting us on trial, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually giving us the opportunity to be qualified. Qualified for what? We'll talk about that. That's why hardships and difficulties are necessary. In a beautiful hadith, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he says, لا يقولن أحدكم اللهم إني أعوذ بك من الفتنة. The Imam says, I don't like to hear anyone saying, Oh God, please save me from being tested. Spare me. Fitna is being tested. Why? Isn't this a good dua? Oh Allah, don't test me. Don't put me through difficulties and hardships. Shouldn't this be a good prayer? Should we not ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from the fitna? Why is Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, telling us not to make such a prayer? The Imam explains. He says, لِأَنَّهُ لَيْسَ أَحَدٌ إِلَّا وَهُوَ مُشْتَمِلٌ عَلَى الْفِتْنَةِ because no human being is spared from the test. That's an impossible supplication. This is a supplication that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not answer. Because every human being has been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life to be tested. It makes no sense for you to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do not test me. That's like going to college or school on the final day of your examination you walk up to your professor and tell him, please spare me from this test. Do not test me. Is this a valid request? No matter how gentle and compassionate your professor is, is this a valid request? The professor will tell you this is exactly why you're here. You've studied all these months, so I would test you on this final day. How can you ask me not to test you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought the human being to this world so the human being is tested. So the Imam says, don't make such a prayer. So then what should we ask for? When we're talking about being tested, what should I ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The commander of the faithful, Amir al-Mu'mineen says, وَلَكِنْ مَنْ اسْتَعَاذْ فَلْيَسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ مُضِلَّاتِ الْفِتْنِ If you want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save you from something, Ask Allah to save you from what? To save you from a test that causes you to be misguided. A test that takes you to the path of deviation. 
This is what you should ask for. Oh Allah, you need to test me. I've been created to be tested. But give me a test that I can handle. Give me a test with the strength so I do not break down. This is what we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the Imam says, Allah states in the Holy Quran, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ fitna." Allah says, your wealth and your children are fitna, are a source of test for you. Through them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us. So the one who is saying, go God, don't test me. In reality, do you know what this person is asking for? In essence, this person is saying, oh Allah, don't give me any wealth. Oh Allah, don't give me any children. Oh Allah, don't allow me to live. That's what it boils down to. Because with children comes a test. With wealth comes a test. With position and power comes a test. The Imam salam, is teaching us that the test is inevitable. Don't ever think you can escape this test. You will never achieve anything if that's your mindset. To the contrary, always convince yourself, remind yourself that I am being tested. That there's a purpose why I've come here to this life. There is a reason for it. There's wisdom behind it. Most of our problems, brothers and sisters, will be alleviated if that's how we think. We will not break down. We will be believers who truly have patience. Most people break down because they don't really believe that they are being tested in this life. They have not fully understood the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created them. Now this explains why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought us down to this life. Many people still wonder, isn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala generous? Isn't He the most generous? Could Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, could He not simply take us all to paradise? Why this world? Why this test? Why all this difficulty? Couldn't Allah through His compassion, through His mercy, just take us all directly to paradise? without having us being subjected to these difficulties of this world. Couldn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have done that? If we want to understand the answer to this question, we need to realize that paradise, the day of judgment, is a special world. It's a truly special experience. I have to be qualified in order to realize what that experience is, if I want to benefit from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment by going to paradise, I have to be qualified for it. And the way by which I become qualified is by experiencing difficulties and hardships in this life and being patient. That's how I make myself qualified. Let me give you an example. Imagine you are the President of a hospital, of a very prominent hospital. Tens of surgeries are performed in this hospital. And you know this person, you know, who's very poor. He doesn't have much. Let's even say he or she's homeless. And we're assuming you're a very generous person. Let me ask you to see if this is a valid scenario. Let's say you go up to this person and you tell him, I'm a very generous person. I really love you, I want the best for you. So why don't you come to my hospital and you be the leading surgeon in my hospital starting from tomorrow. This is how I treat you. From my kindness, from my generosity, I am giving you this position. Starting from tomorrow, you will be the leader of all the surgeons and you will perform 10 operations tomorrow and I will give you $50,000 for those operations. Is this a good deal or a bad deal? What do you think? Imagine if this person accepts, he brings him to the hospital, this person is not qualified to be the leader of surgeons. This person will end up killing those innocent patients because this person is not qualified. This person is not trained. You have to be trained. You have to be qualified to be in such an important position. We don't call this generosity if this person is given this position. This is not wisdom. This is, in fact, injustice. If you bring this person who has no experience 
who's not a real surgeon, and you place him in this important position, you are actually committing an act of injustice to this person, to the hospital, and to the patients. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indeed generous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can take any human being to paradise, but we have to develop ourselves in this life. We have to earn that position. We have to be qualified. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is generous. The problem is our capacity. We need to have the appropriate capacity in order to experience the bliss of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. To give you another example, you know, imagine you have this businessman who is known for his generosity. Now if a person walks up to this man, to this businessman, and he asks for money, he tells him, you're generous, right? Please give, I'm asking $10,000 from you. And we know that this person who's asking for money will take this $1,000 and do drugs with it. Or more, he'll purchase a rifle and kill an innocent person. What should, the, what should this businessman do? Should he give him the money? In the name of generosity, should she give him the money? Yes, I'm generous, I'll give you the money. You do whatever you want with it. You can go kill whomever you want. You can do as much as drugs as you, as you like. This is not generosity. This is lack of wisdom. This is injustice if this businessman gives money to this person. Allah is generous, but the problem is, brothers and sisters, some people in this life do not deserve the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they will take God's generosity and they will misuse it. That's the real problem. There was a man during the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, by the name of Tha'lam ibn Hatib. He was a poor man, but he used to fulfill his religious obligations, even though he had you know, a, little, a, a small amount of money, he would pay his religious dues, he would give some charity to the poor. One day he comes to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, he tells him, Ya Rasulullah, I know that if you do dua, if you ask God, if you supplicate, Allah will not reject you. The Prophet says, yes, that's true, what do you want? He says, I'm asking that you ask God to make me rich, I want to be rich. By the blessings of your supplication, have Allah make me rich, please. The Prophet, peace be upon him, tells him, Oh man, it's better for you to stay where you are. He keeps insisting, No, I want to become rich. The Prophet says, I'm telling you, take my advice. It's better for you to stay and remain where you are. It's not in your interest to be a rich person. Now you're fulfilling your obligations. When you become rich, God knows what you'll do with that wealth. He keeps insisting and insisting until the Prophet, peace be upon him, gives up on him and he says, okay, fine, I'll do the dua for you. But you'll have to deal with the consequences. I warned you. He says, it's okay, just do the dua, I'll take care of it. The Prophet does the dua for him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes him rich. He only had a few sheep. Within a short amount of time, they begin to multiply. He becomes one of the wealthiest men in Medina. Now this man, when he was poor, he would come to the Salah five times a day. He would hear, hear the sermons of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Now that he is busy with his livestock, with the sheep, with the camels, with his farmland, he would only come once a day. After a while, he only came once a week until he was no longer seen in the masjid. After a while, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse of the zakat, instructing the believers to give charity, mandatory charity. The Prophet sent two people after him. O Thalaban, you've got all this wealth. Now Allah has revealed the verse. You have to give 2.5% of your wealth as zakat. You know what he says? He says, what am I, a kafir that the Prophet is asking me for this money? This is injustice. He forgot that the wealth he achieved was through the dua of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Imagine what happened to this man. He destroyed his hereafter because of the wealth. Now was it in his interest that, the, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give him this wealth? This man was not up to it. 
He did not have that capacity. He was not qualified. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala denies these types of people, that does not go against Allah's generosity. In fact, that fits perfectly with the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is truly wise. So when we think about God's mercy, brothers and sisters, God is merciful. He will forgive. He will give us much more than we, what we deserve. But here in this life, it is our only opportunity to make ourselves qualified. The more I work on myself, the more I fulfill my obligations, the more I remain patient in the face of challenges and hardships and difficulties, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate my status on the day of judgment the more I will become deserving of that grand reward. There must be difficulties and hardships, brothers and sisters. Don't ever think that my goal is to live a life of comfort. That's not the goal. One day the Prophet, peace be upon him, told his companions, my dear companions, do not pursue that which does not exist. If something doesn't exist, don't go after it. Imagine, you're looking for a product, right? Let's say the iPhone 6, okay? Imagine someone every day going to the Apple store at 5 a.m. waiting to buy the iPhone 6. Is that wise? It doesn't exist. There's no such thing right now. What's the point of searching for something that does not exist? The Prophet, peace be upon him, says real comfort in this life does not exist. So you're wasting your time and energy and resources if you pursue something that does not exist in this world. Allah has not created us for comfort in this life. Allah has created us for sacrifice, for difficulties, for hardships, because these are good for us. They develop us, they build us, and make us qualified for the great reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here we have a beautiful hadith from an Imam al kadhim peace be upon him, the seventh Imam of Ahl al-Bayt. The Imam salam states, إِنَّ الدُّنْيَا لَا تُنَالُ إِلَّا بِمَشَقَّةٍ Listen to these beautiful words of wisdom, these gems. The Imam says, those people who want to achieve success in this life, our goal is to be successful, right? The Imam says, those people, who achieve success in this life, they must go through difficulty. You think successful people in our society, whether you know at the political level, at the economic level, at the social level, do you think suddenly they became successful, they did not earn it? They went through so much difficulty for them to achieve a worldly position. You know, the average successful businessman, do you think they just miraculously became successful? They had, most of them had to go through a difficult path. Years and years of struggling allowed them to achieve such a position. You know, I remember once I was reading about Steve Jobs. You know, this man did achieve success, but do you really know he really earned it? When he was a young man studying, he was poor, he had nothing. He would work day and night. He had a daytime job, a nighttime job. And I remember I once read about this project that he was working on. He was working at an electronic company, electronics company. Now they had promised him if he was able to achieve something, they would give him $700. They had given him a board that had 100 chips in it. They told him, listen, if you can reduce the size of the chip, we'll give you $700. Eventually, he was able to achieve that. He reduced the size of the board from 100 chips to 46 chips. So almost in half, less than half. However, he had to go through four sleepless nights in order to achieve that. Have you ever in your life gone without sleep for four days? Some people will break down. Some people will probably end up in the hospital if they do that. But this man had the dedication. He struggled four days until he achieved what he wanted to do. Now sometimes, you know, when I read that, I really felt ashamed of myself. I said, this young man, for $700, he sacrificed his comfort, his sleep, for four days, for four nights. 
And what have I done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Have I spent one night only, one night till dawn in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Some of us, you know, most of us don't even care. Some of us, if we take out the Holy Quran, or if we stand in the middle of the night, Praying to God 10-15 minutes, we think we've made a grand achievement. And we act as if we have done Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a huge favor. We feel so sleepy, we're not even interacting with the Quran, with the Salah. 10-15 minutes. And you have this person, for $700, he was willing to sacrifice four nights of his comfortable sleep. But he achieved success. Here in this world, this man achieved success. So Imam al-Kadhim is teaching us that if you want to achieve success, you have to work hard. There is no other way. Then the Imam says, Now if you want to achieve success on the Day of Judgment, in the next life, that also requires sacrifice and difficulty. So the Imam is presenting two beautiful scenes here, two options here. The Imam is saying, if you want this world, if you want this life, you have to work hard. If you want the Akhirah, the Day of Judgment, if you want to go to Paradise, you have to work hard. Which one should I choose? The Imam says, فَاخْتَارُوا مِنَ الْمَشَقَّةِ أَبْقَارًا The Imam says, if you have to choose between one of these two, and they both require hard work. Absolutely, they both require dedication, and sacrifice. The Imam says, at least choose the one that will last longer. Which one lasts longer? This world or the next life? If you have to work hard anyway, at least work hard for the right cause. At least work hard for the life that lasts more. That is more everlasting. Don't work for something that's temporary. Now in these nights, brothers and sisters, this is the lesson we learned from an Imam al-Husayn, peace be upon him. The art of sacrifice. An Imam al-Husayn is a true university when it comes to sacrifice. When it comes to difficulties and hardships and remaining patient in the face of these challenges. Nothing short of a grand, ultimate university. Let's learn from the sacrifices of an Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. First of all, an Imam al Hussein accepted the will of Allah. Some of us, even if we work hard, we go through difficulties and hardships, but deep down in our hearts, we're not satisfied. Oh Allah, why have you chosen me for this test? Oh Allah, why am I going through difficulties? Some, some of us don't say it on our tongues, but deep down in our hearts, we reject the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, one of the blueprints of his sacrifice is that he fully accepted in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he left the city of Makina, the city of Mecca, on his way to Karbala, what did the Imam alayhi salam state? He said, Rida Allah ridana ahl al bayt. The satisfaction of God is our satisfaction, the Ahl. Whatever he's willed, we are pleased with. And during his final moments, when he was breathing his final moments, what did the Imam salam state? Imagine this scene. The Imam surrounded by the enemies. He's been struck by so many swords. So many arrows are implanted in his body. And he's who? Al Hussein ibn Ali. The grandson of the Holy Prophet, an infallible Imam. What does he say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Does he say, oh Allah, why? What have I done? Why did you allow for this to happen? The first thing that comes from the tongue of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he says, Ilahi ridhak biqada. Oh Allah, I've accepted. I've accepted your will. I worship you, Allah. I don't complain, I do not object. This is the sacrifice that the Imam salam, teaches us. Sacrifice, work hard, and accept this in your heart from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
in beautiful lines of poetry, the Imam السلام, describes his love and sacrifice for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in which the Imam has been narrated to say, Ilahi taraktun khalqa turran fi hawaka, wa aytamtu al-iyala likay araka. O oh Allah, I've abandoned this world, the creation. O oh Allah, I'm allowing my own children to be orphaned. Why? In your path. For your sake. فَلَوْ قَطَّعْتَنِي فِي الْحُبِّ إِرْبًا لَمَا مَا مَنْ فُعَادِ إِلَى سُوَاكَ Allah, Allah. Oh Allah, if you cut me into pieces, my heart will not sway. I will still be connected to you, Allah. I will still have that love and affection for you, Ya Allah. This is the love that an Imam al Hussein salam achieved. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, brothers and sisters, compensated an Imam al Hussein salam in a mind boggling way. Till this very day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is compensating the Imam for his sacrifices. One day, Al Imam al Sadiq salam was amongst his companions, and he said that because Al Imam al Hussein salam sacrificed, Allah gave him so many things, but the Imam pointed out three things. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed the power of healing in the soil. Secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed the power of having our supplications answered under his dome. And thirdly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the Imams from his progeny. Now the companion of the Imam asked him, Oh Imam, but how does Imam al Hussein personally benefit from this? I mean, if there's healing in a soil, the people benefit. What does an Imam al Hussein himself benefit from this? And including the fact that our prayers are answered under his dome, we benefit because Allah answers our prayers. What does Imam al Hussein himself get from his sacrifice? Do you know what the Imam said? And Imam al-Sadiq said to this man, to this companion, that due to the sacrifices of Imam al Hussein, Allah rewarded him by placing Imam al Hussein directly next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in paradise. Sallu ala Allah. 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 That is the ultimate reward that Imam al Hussein achieved. And do you know what the status of the Holy Prophet is? Can we even describe what the status that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Holy Prophet? This same status has been given to his grandson Hussein for the sacrifices that he offered on the day of Ashura. Imam al Hussein is teaching us that when you sacrifice, Allah will be generous with you, Allah will reward you. Just give some, only some, just a few of what you have. A bit of what you have, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you an infinite amount of reward. And Imam al Hussein alayhi salam teaches us also that our sacrifices bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, imagine if there is a son who sacrifices for his mother. Yes, the mother is benefited because her son is sacrificing for her, he's treating her well. He's being of service to her. He's helping her. But the son is also benefiting, brothers and sisters. A son or daughter who sacrifice for their mother, they are also benefiting. First of all, a son who sacrifices his mother loves his mother more than a son who does not sacrifice. Isn't this a reality? Yes, he's going through difficulty, through hardship for his mother. But a son, a child who sacrifices for his or her parents, loves his or her parents more than those children who do nothing for their parents. That's number one. Number two, these children who sacrifice for their parents, they love their par parents more than other children who do not sacrifice. Number three, this mother loves her children who sacrifice for her more than those who do not. And number four, these children who sacrifice for their parents, they are more willing to obey them and not upset them. They're more concerned with them. 
And Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam teaches us that when you sacrifice in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though you're experiencing difficulties and hardships, but you're achieving the satisfaction of Allah, you will begin to love Allah more when you sacrifice. And Allah will love you more. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you a greater reward. So when we sacrifice, we are the first to benefit, brothers and sisters. We have nothing to lose. In fact, we have everything to give. We have nothing to lose. When you give to Allah, who is the source of all blessings in the world, you have nothing to lose. You're simply protecting your own interests in this life and on the Day of Judgment. This is what we learned from Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Now, Imam al Hussein on the Day of Ashura, he made a declaration, a grand call. When all of his family members were killed, when all of his companions were killed, what did the Imam السلام, say? The Imam السلام, stood by the tents and he said, Is there anyone who can help me and support the grandson of the Prophet? Who was the Imam speaking to? To dead bodies? Who did the Imam السلام, address when he said, is there anyone who can support me? Obviously there was no one else who could help the Imam. All of those who had come to help him were massacred, they were killed. Who was the Imam speaking to, brothers and sisters? The Imam السلام, was addressing you, he was addressing me. He was speaking to us, he was inviting us to also learn from him how to sacrifice. Let us sacrifice for Abi Abdullah. From our time, from our energy, for the betterment of our society, let's sacrifice. In order to increase our knowledge, we need to sacrifice. To protect our families and their faith, we need to sacrifice. To educate non-Muslims about Islam, we need to sacrifice. To help our brothers and sisters in society, we need to sacrifice. The Imam السلام, is asking us to be a participant with him. To, try to participate with him in this act of sacrifice. And this is a great honor for us, brothers and sisters. Let's honor Al Imam Al Hussein. Let's do something for this Imam. Tonight, let me go back home and ask myself, what have I done to Al Imam Al Hussein? He gave everything, so I have a chance at believing in this message in Islam. He saved Islam through his blood. In return, what have I done for Imam Al Hussein? And Imam al Hussein is generous, brothers and sisters. It has been narrated there was this woman. This woman who was corrupt, who was sinful. She had a neighbor. When Ashura came, this neighbor would hold a majlis, a gathering in his home, to commemorate the tragedy of Imam al Hussein. One night she wanted some fire, she wanted to cook something. She was out of work. This was decades ago before these modern stoves. So she says, let me go into my neighbor's house. He's probably cooking something for these people. So I'll take some fire from him and bring it to my home. She walks in the, into the kitchen. The people were still in the majlis and was continuing. And she realized there was a pot on the stove that was being cooked. So she came to take some water, some fire from under the pot she realized that the fire was out. The food was not being cooked. So since she wanted fire, she went and she brought some fire, she made some fire under the pot and she took some fire for herself and she went back home. Now if she had not done that, when the majlis would finish, these people would not have the food available to them. They had to wait an hour or two before the food would be cooked. So she saved the food for them that night. Now imagine, this is a sinful woman, brothers and sisters. She goes back home that night. She falls asleep. She sees in her dream that the day of judgment has arrived. And due to her sinful actions, she's being dragged by the angels towards hell. As she's being pushed into hell, suddenly she hears a cry saying, please stop, do not throw her into hell. She, took, she looks back, she sees the face of an Imam al Hussein. He tells the angel, stop. Don't throw this woman in hell. They tell him, oh Abu Abdullah, why? Don't you know she's a sinful woman? What has she done for you to save her? He says, 
Tonight, the reason why I'm saving her because she went to my majlis and she simply put on the fire so that those who came to my majlis would not be delayed. I have to thank her for what she did. This is an Imam al Hussein, brothers and sisters. Even an act this small, the Imam salam will compensate you for. Don't underestimate Abi Abdullah al Hussein. When you serve Hussein, you're serving yourself. When you serve Hussein, you're bringing happiness to the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Tonight is a very important night. Let's try to replay the events of Karbala in our minds. Let us give our sincere condolences to Al Imam al Mahdi. Tomorrow is the day of Ashura, the greatest tragedy that occurred in history. I urge everyone to take the day off tomorrow to participate in these events. I mean no offense to anyone, but I feel it's a shame if I go to school and work tomorrow. The day on which the skies rained blood for Hussein, the day in which the Holy Prophet Fatima Zahra Ali ibn Abi Talib are going through Aza, through a difficult state. How can I go out and, and, and do my normal activities? This is an insult to Rasulullah. If a loved one from me dies, do I go that same day to my normal activities? There is only one day of Ashura throughout the year. Let's commemorate tomorrow, brothers and sisters. I really urge everyone. And the hadith from an Imam al-Sadiq You know, some people say, well, I have a job, I can't, it's difficult. Let me share with you this hadith from an Imam al-Sadiq. Why is it that we work, brothers and sisters? To make a living, right? So Allah blesses our lives because the income is a blessing from Allah. When you have money, it's a blessing from God. And Imam al-Sadiq says, the one who works on the day of Ashura, Allah will take away the blessing from that money that he achieves and the, the blessing from his life. So those who go and work on the day of Ashura, and I mean no offense, I say this with so much love and compassion for you. This person is damaging himself and wasting his time. Because that day, even though he will make something, Allah will take away the barakah, the blessings from this man. Tomorrow is an extremely tragic day. We cannot forget the day of Ashura. Tomorrow is a day of mourning. It's a day of sorrow. It's a day on which we show our love, our consolation to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Now, brothers and sisters, let's take our hearts to Karbala. Let's take our hearts to Karbala on the night of Ashura. What was going on in Karbala on such a night? Imagine the darkness of the night. What a night. What a day is waiting for the Ahlul Bayt. Oh Zainab, what a day you have to face tomorrow. So many tragedies, oh Zainab, you have to face tomorrow, the day of Ashura. It's the beginning of all her tragedies. It's the beginning of her sorrows. It's the beginning of her difficulties. One of the companions of Imam al Hussein by the name of Nafi' ibn Hilal. He says, on the night of Ashura, we were in the tents. The Imam had gathered his companions. He gave them a speech. He was preparing them for martyrdom. He was preparing them for the day of Ashura. Nafi' ibn Hilal says, I realized if the Imam al Hussein was missing from the tents. He was not in the tent. I figured, where is Hussein? Where is he in this desert? I was afraid someone from the enemies would come and harm him. He says, I went in the darkness of the night searching for Abi Abdullah al Hussein. He says, I found him finally. He was sitting on the ground, he was plucking something out from the ground. I told him, Abu Abdullah, what are you doing in this dark night out here in the desert? What are you removing from the ground? The Imam salam, says, oh enough. Tomorrow is the day of Ashura. Tomorrow after they kill me, they shall attack the tents. They will set them to fire. The children will be running from one tent to other to another tent, and there are thorns on the ground. I'm removing these thorns. I don't want them to go into the feet of my children. May God help your heart, Allah. It's so difficult. 
When a tragedy is approaching you and you know what's going to happen. When you know what will happen to your family, to your children. It's a very difficult test for this the Imam salam goes back into the tent. He gathers his companions. He tells them how Allah has pleased with them for them willing to make, to make this ultimate sacrifice. On such a night, the companions of Imam al Hussein were engaging in reading the Quran and supplicating. In fact, the army of Yazid wanted to kill the Imam on the 9th of Muharram. But the Imam السلام, sent his brother Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas to those enemies to request from them to give them one more night. He told them, oh Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, ask them to give us one more night. Why, oh Hussein? Hussein is not afraid of death. He's the master of courage. Why does he want one more night from the enemies? He says, I swear by God how much I love Salah. I want to pray some raka'at on this final night. Appreciate your salah, brothers and sisters. Your master Hussein requested one more night for salah. The Imam السلام, wanted to farewell the children. He came to Zainab. Zainab, at this point, she could not help it. She was dying from depression and sorrow. And Imam al Hussein, he places his hand on her chest to give her some comfort, and through the blessings of Allah, she finds some comfort. The Imam tells her, Oh Zainab, tomorrow you have a very difficult responsibility. You have to take care of the women. You have to take care of the orphans, of the children. You are the one whom everyone will look up to. Oh Zainab, don't break down. Be strong after I am killed. The Imam السلام, makes one request from Zainab. He says, Zainab, after I die, when the night comes, and you pray salat and me, don't forget me from your dawn, Salat al But do you know how Zainab prayed Salat al on Ashura that evening? She could not stand up. She would be sitting and doing Salat al She did not have the energy in order to stand up and pray. But she fulfilled the promise of Hussein, and she did remember him in her Salat till the day that she passed away. The Imam السلام, on such a night, he goes into the tents of the women and the children. The Imam السلام, his son Zayn al-Abideen was extremely ill. And Imam Zayn al-Abideen could not get up, he was so ill. The Imam is gathering everyone and he's reminding them that the Imam of their time after him is his son Zayn al-Abideen. The Imam السلام, tells him, وَأَنْتَ خَلِيفَتِي عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ الْأَطْفَالِ وَالْعِيَالِ Oh my dear son Zayn al-Abideen, you shall be my representative after me. You shall be the guardian of these women, of these children. فَإِنَّهُمْ غُرَبَاءَ مَخْذُونُونَ My dear son, these children are strangers. They have no one. You take care of them. وَقَدْ شَمِلَتُهُمُ الْمِلَّةُ وَالْيُوثُ سَكِّرْهُمْ إِلَىٰ صَرَخُوا My dear son, when you hear them crying, try to quiet them. Try to comfort their hearts. وَآنَسُهُمْ إِذَا سَتَوْحَشُوا My dear son, when the children feel lonely after I am killed, you be for there for them. You try to remove this loneliness from their hearts. وَسَلِّ خَوَاطِرَهُمْ بِلِينَ الْكَلَامِ فَإِنَّهُمْ مَا بَقِيَ مِنْ رِجَالِهِمْ مَنْ يَسْتَأْنِسُونَ بِهِ My dear son, they have no one to seek comfort from. All of their fathers, their uncles, their brothers have been killed. So you be the man, my dear son. You be the one who gives them the comfort. Then the Imam alayhi salam, he calls on, on the women, on his sisters, on his daughters. Ya Zainab wa ya Arubab wa ya Rutayya wa ya Sukayna. They all gather, the Imam alayhi salam is farewelling them on the night of Ashura. Then the Imam points at Zayn al-Abideen. He tells them, Zainab, this is the Imam after me. Sukayna, this is the Imam. You obey this Imam. He is the source of guidance after me. 
And then the Imam السلام, makes a request from his son, Al Imam Zain al Abidin. And the Imam is speaking to us, listen to this. The Imam tells him, My dear son, My dear son, please convey my salam to my Shia. Abu Abdullah, what do you want to tell us on such a night? We say As-salamu alayka ya Abu Abdullah, but what do you want to tell us? Wa qallahu inna abhi tadmata abshanun fil khuru Tell my Shia, my father Hussain, that thirsty Whenever you drink water, remember my father Hussain Wa ma ya tadariban fandubu Shia to my followers to remember me, to commemorate my tragedy, to cry on my tragedy, and to learn from my sacrifices. Oh Abu Abdullah, yes we remember you. We shall remember you every day of our lives for what you did, for the sacrifices that you had to go through. One of the most difficult sacrifices, brothers and sisters, is a sacrifice no father, no mother can handle, that the Imam had to go through. You know, when you have an infant, it's very difficult to see your infant go through so much difficulty. To see your infant go through pain. If you have an infant and this infant is, has only a fever, can you sleep that night? Hajar, the wife of Ibrahim, had to go through a very difficult test. When Prophet Ibrahim takes them to Mecca, Allah instructs Ibrahim, Ibrahim, leave Hajar and your infant son Ismail in Mecca. Hajar tells him, oh Ibrahim, I have nothing here, there's no one here. I only have a few pieces of date and only some water. Ibrahim says, this is the will of God, trust Allah, He will help you. When Ibrahim leaves, shortly after the water finishes, Hajar is seeing her son Ismail, is withering in the heat of Mecca. He's, he's crying, he wants water, she does not know what to do. So a narration tells us Ismail was so thirsty that he took the fingers of his mother and he began to suckle on the finger of his mother. Telling your mother, I want some water. She did not want to know what to do. She went back and forth seven times looking for water. It was a mirage. She thought it was water, but she could not find any water. When she lost hope, she thought her son had died. She did not know what happened. Her son was crying. He wanted water, but suddenly he was crying. She told herself, Khalas, my son is dead. He's died from thirst when she goes back to him and she sees Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause the water to come from Zamzam and he was drinking the water that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him. She was comforted to know that her son had some water. But all oh, believers, Abu Abdullah also had an infant on the day of Ashwa. Zainab calls Hussein. She tells him, Hussein, we don't know what to do. His mother, Rabaim, she can no longer breastfeed him. She's out of milk. There's no water we can give him. Don't you see his withering? The Imam Ali salam takes Ali and al Azhar, Abdullah, Rabi, and his mom. Seeing his infant withering, he tells them, what should I do? I don't have any water. They tell him, take him to those enemies. Maybe they'll have mercy on him. Maybe they'll take, they'll give him some water. The Imam Ali salam carries his infant in his arm. He goes out to the battlefield. He stands in front of those enemies who had no mercy in their hearts. He tells them, all oh, people, if I have committed a sin, if you do not like what I've done in any way, then what is the sin of my infant? Don't you see it withering like a flower? Give him some water, he's dying from thirst. Those enemies, they began to argue, should we give water, should we not? Some of them say, yes, it's only a baby, why should we deny this baby some water? Others said, no, we shall not give you a single drop. At that point, Omar ibn Sa'ad, the, the leader of Yazid's army, 
يا ريفان بدينا ما بحر وما لا it was a war how about don't you see they're arguing stop them immediately from arguing he tells him what should I do he says you know what you need to do stop the argument that's taking place Harmala says I saw Imam al-Hussein he was carrying his infant in his arms and he was in his swaddle and then I saw the whiteness of his neck I took out an arrow a three-headed spear and I shot the neck of that baby Rahimallahu Madnada severs his head, the baby starts to struggle, he takes out his arms from the swaddle, the Imam alayhi salam, he collects the blood from under his neck, and the Imam throws the blood into the air, and the Imam says, oh Allah, you bear witness what happened, the Imam wanted to collapse, but he said, oh Allah, you're the one who gives me patience for this tragedy. The Imam takes his slaughtered son in his arm. One narration tells us that when the Imam came back to the tent, the Imam was wearing an abaya, he was wearing a cloak. He was hiding a hidden under the cloak. He was embarrassed. How can he go back to the tent? What should he say to Zainab? What should he say to his mother Rabah? He took the baby alive, but now the baby is dead. This so one narration says the Iman came back and forth seven times. He would come to the tent, he would go back. And the woman realized something was wrong. The back of Iman and Hussein was bent. Some of them hardly recognized him because he was in so much pain. The Zainab comes out from the tent. So Kaina comes out. The father Hussein. Zainab collapses, so Kainab collapses upon the scene, but now his mother Rabab comes. She takes her baby, she places it next to her chest. <laughs> My dear Ali, my dear son, so many sleepless nights that I spent trying to raise you, trying to give comfort. Now I push your cradle, but your cradle is empty. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi وسيعلم الذين ظلموا على محمد أن يهن قلب ينقلبون. Everyone together. Let's say our salam to Abu Abdullah al Hussein. السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين. Brothers and sisters, I urge you, please take your seats. Let's continue with the program. Let's show our sorrow. I know it's late and we need to get back home, but this is only one night of Ashura. Let's show our love for Imam al Hussein on such a night. Let's participate in the following program. <laughs> Thank you.